Um, two years ago, I was asked to go to the nation of Fiji to talk about creation. Um, now, we, we, I, I've been to 14 different countries. I'll typically go to churches, to Bible schools, to usually Christian schools, and we'll present the evidence for creation. It's always well received, and I feel like I'm really building up the Christian community, but I seldom get into the public education system. And the same is true in America. I found, I've been speaking on creation for about 30 years, and there's just an enormous frustration amongst the Christian community that God is left out of our education of, of the next generation. And that's really just been in my lifetime. That wasn't the case in the 1900s all the way up into the 1950s. The Bible was, was very much revered and used, but it's been left out for now two generations. Now, the background of Fiji, to understand what you're gonna see as I talk this morning, is that it was considered the most evil, horrendously nasty nation in the entire world in the 1800s. It was called the cannibal capital of the world. Um, missionaries were eaten when they went there, uh, but that just motivated more missionaries to come. A very hierarchical society where they, they, they the people literally revered and followed their king. If they were told they were going to be eaten, they would just submit to it. I, I'm serious. The king bragged that he had eaten 990 human beings. That was what, that was, and he was proud of that. They didn't, they didn't see anything wrong with eating other human beings. It's totally decadent, evil, satanic society. Now the missionaries came, and just like in Nineveh, they got through to the head ruler king of the entire nation who had unified the Fiji Islands, he realized that the God who had made everything had become a human being and had died for him. I mean, it was real. It was a real change to the point he realized, I am incredibly evil. I can't eat someone made in the image of God. So they not only changed their entire culture, they changed their very clothing so they weren't tempted by, tempted by human flesh. It, and it was a revival throughout the whole nation, and it was like that way for 100 years. Churches spread, very strong Christian society at that point. Now, bring us up to the present day. Okay, we're talking a nation that is, in essence, a Christian nation for over 100 years. They are watching their young people drift away and become less and less interested in Christianity. Uh, and they want to do something about it. They don't want to see it go the way America and England and Australia and, and Europe has went where Christianity is becoming less and less influential. So I proposed to the missionary, what if I could get into the public education system of your nation and give every child one of these books called Pearls in Paradise. We actually, this, the American version is called Have You Considered? where every day is an evidence from biology, or geology, or anatomy, or history, or astronomy, or physics, showing the credibility of the Bible, with a Bible verse at the bottom of each page. And the missionary was like super, super excited. Um, okay, hang on just a second, I'm almost to my presentation. So I went back a little over a year ago, a year and a half ago, we printed 20,000 books, had them shipped directly to Fiji, um, and then we got into the school system to do one-hour presentations in their public education system. Now, to understand the impact, you understand it's been 150 years since Christianity was birthed in this nation. And they have drifted from this solid belief in Jesus Christ died for our sins. It's by His works that we come back into fellowship with God to a works mentality of we got to obey all these rules, we got to obey the commandments, we got to be good people, we can earn our way into heaven. That's kind of the, the philosophy. And yet, the Bible's still revered and, and Christianity is still in the schools. It's not been kicked out. Because they understand that's what brought them out of cannibalism. Just, just a real quick aside. We worked with the pastors and the leaders in this country. And uh, one, of, one of the original relatives, the great, great, great grandson of this original cannibal king is now a pastor. He would bring the older message at the end of our presentations. He said, well, I, you know, I had a man from Australia come into our church uh, and he, and he um, brought his kids and he said, there's one thing I don't understand about your country. He says, why 
do you have so much religion? Why do you kind of blend religion when we're trying to teach the kids about truth and reality and facts and science? Why do you keep bringing God up? And then he said, the, and they all speak with an English accent because it's an English colony. So this great-great-grandson, he said, he looked at this Australian atheist and he said, if it were not for Jesus Christ, I would be eating you right now. <laughs> <laughs> he got right to the point. So they don't want to leave God out, and yet they see their youth drifting away. We brought American scientists, credible academic degreed scientific speakers, to do assemblies in their school, and they were just blown away that uh, we would bring scientifically credentialed people into their little developing nation school systems. And then we gave every student one of these books, which is in essence, other than the Bible, which was distributed throughout the nation, the only book most of these kids will ever own. So they were just blown away by this. Uh, and then at the end, we would always present the gospel message. Who is this creator that we have just been talking to you about? The sincerity that was in the atmosphere at these schools when they were asking Jesus Christ to be their personal savior and by the, by the tens of thousands. I'd never seen anything like it. And I'm gonna take about 15 minutes and give you a, a um, just kind of a, a shortened version of what these kids are hearing. How to connect the Bible to what they consider to be reality, everything else they're learning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That would be our first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I would explain to them that a lot of people think this, the Bible is all about religion and everything else you're learning in your school system. And it was a very good school system where they have uniforms, they have textbooks that are shared amongst students. Um, they really have poured a lot of education into the education system in Fiji. So these aren't dumb students and they have access to the internet, they have access to all the American movies. So they're being trained that evolution's a fact, millions of years is a fact, um, all these slow processes have happened throughout time. So, so they've segregated the Bibles about religious stuff and then the school systems about scientific stuff. Kind of like American students, same thing. And um, so I'd explain to them, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It's a statement of reality and fact. Um, in the beginning is time. The heavens is a Hebrew word that means, in essence, space. And the earth is a Hebrew word that in essence means matter. Time, space, and matter has a cause, which is God. And then I would talk to them about the book of Romans states that everybody, in chapter 1 of Romans, starting at verse 19, everybody is without excuse for belief in God because of what he has made. Real simple concepts that they can understand. If you think of the entire universe as a box, the box either made itself or the box has a box maker. And there are no other options, ultimately. Ultimately, you have to believe one or the other. And what you're seeing in your textbooks, what you're hearing on the movies, is simply a viewpoint to try to explain everything as if the box made itself. And they get this, okay? So then I would start to talk about the complexity of life. Um, what is life? What is it made of? And I would use a little illustration I, I, I use in churches I speak in everywhere called the magic can of evolution. And I'd say, our bodies are made out of lots of very complex chemicals. Just like if you dump everything out of this can, it turns out the can has a pin inside. And a pin is a little machine. It's got a mechanism so it clicks and the ink cartridge comes in and out. And it's made of many parts. Like this particular pin has a tip, it has a spring, it has an ink cartridge, and then on the other side it has a clip so it will go over your pocket, and a little clicker mechanism, and a tube to hold it all together. Now these parts are specifically designed to be a pin. The exact same thing is true in the biological world. The parts of any creature or any organism or any plant or our bodies, it's made out of hundreds of thousands of parts that are all specifically designed. And these parts aren't just floating around someplace. Now in their textbooks, in the American textbooks, there's an experiment 
where in 1952, a researcher named Stanley Miller, he added explosive energy to chemicals to supposedly create the parts you need for life. Well, if you think about it, I have all the parts I need for a pen. And I can add energy. I can shake it. I can spin it. You know, I can kick it. I can throw it. Is it going to turn back into a pen? See, and the kids, they're getting this. I mean, we're talking assemblies of a thousand kids. And um, so I would explain this stuff to them. And then I'd say, well, maybe we're using the wrong kind of energy. Maybe we have to add explosive energy. So I put a firecracker here. And then we're going to add explosive, and we really do this, OK, um, to the can. And we added lots of energy to the can. Oh, man. And then you pull out the can, and there's the pin reassembled. Now imagine a thousand high school kids when you pull this pin out. They just, you can't shut down the laughter. They are laughing so hard because they know it's absurd. It is ridiculous to believe that random processes, random energy, could reassemble something and make it more complex. And yet life is a million times more complex than this pen. There's only six parts, specifically designed parts. And they don't even occur naturally. Now, then I would take time and I would show these kids how complex these parts are. The most basic molecule in our body is called a protein. Now, they're not all the same. Our hair is made out of a certain protein. Our skin is a different protein. Hemoglobin in our blood is a completely different protein. The proteins are like a long chain where the beads, the different colored beads, are amino acids. Now, in that 1952 experiment, what happened was a few of these different color beads were formed when they add an explosive spark of energy to methane and ammonia and various chemicals. So they made a few of the colors. Every form of life has 20 different colors. They didn't make all of them. They, they all are like right hand and left hand gloves. If you look at a right hand glove and a left hand glove, they're essentially identical and yet you can't get the left hand glove on your right hand. Every time this experiment is run, you get both and yet life only uses the left hand gloves. So it's impossible you could just form the right kind of chain or get the colors in the right order. This is what one typical protein looks like. So I'm running back and forth across the stage at these, at these presentations. And I explain to the kids, every single color has to be in exactly the right spot or it's the wrong protein. And it doesn't bend and twist and fold in the right way and it doesn't carry oxygen, or it doesn't form a skin cell, or it doesn't form hair. And it is impossible just by randomly grabbing colors to get them in the right spot. They were placed there just like the parts of the pin are specifically designed to be a pin. The molecules are specifically designed to form and work in exactly the right way. And it becomes obvious by observing creation we absolutely know what the truth is. Most people kind of know there, there's something behind it all. E even, even folks who are trained evolution's a fact, they kind of think, well, maybe God, God guided evolution. Now tonight, I'm, I'm gonna show you how the mechanisms of evolution, this mut idea of mutations, this idea of natural selection, could not possibly scientifically be true. It's all fantasy. But if we're not explaining it to the people around us, if we're not explaining it to the next generation, they're just going to assume it's true because they're reading about it and they're hearing about it and it permeates their thinking. So where do you put this creation of life? Where do you put all of the creation of all these creatures into the history of this planet? We're all surrounded by a system that tells us there have been millions, hundreds of millions, billions of years of Earth history, which means there have been millions of years of slow, somehow, transformation, because in the rock layers you see these different kind of creatures. So I got to take time, whenever we do these presentations, to put this creation of life, this God's action with creation, into a real timeline of Earth history. You've got to deal with the fossils 
the rock layers, the reality of what has happened in the past on Earth. So I always bring a fossil, and I say, this is an animal that used to be alive. It's called a trilobite. But the fact is, we dig these up by the millions in the rock layers all over the Earth. Millions of this and other kind of creatures have been buried. But nobody ever picks up one of these fossils, and they listen really carefully, and they hear it say, a hundred million years ago, I was crawling on the bottom of the ocean, and a rock hit me in the head. Really? Really. What happened next? I died. It doesn't talk. Fossils don't talk. Fossils don't come with labels attached. They all have to be interpreted. Now, to be interpreted, you have to start with some viewpoint of history. If you are trained to believe the box made itself and everything in the box made itself, time, matter, energy came from the Big Bang, stars formed by themselves, heavier chemicals spilled out of the stars, they turned into more complex chemicals that turned into life that slowly, as copies were made and those copies had changes, single cell organisms turned into multicellular organisms that turned into fish, that turned into land animals, that turned into dinosaurs, that turned into birds and monkeys and eventually people. And that's taught as a fact throughout our culture, and it has been for almost 100 years now. You're going to interpret the fossils in that viewpoint. See, these the professors, the people writing the books, the museums, they're not made by stupid people. They spent their life studying this stuff, but they're trained to think in only a certain way. Millions of years, billions of years, everything has made itself over huge periods of time. So when they find a fossil, they're going to interpret it that way. But that doesn't make it true. I pretty much finished my presentation. I've talked about fossils. I talk about how fossils form. I talk about fossils aren't forming today. They don't form today. When a fish dies in a lake, when a fish dies in the ocean, it doesn't form a fossil. It gets totally decayed. It deteriorates. It gets totally recycled. When a tree falls on a forest, it doesn't form a fossil. It gets turned back into soil by fungus. And, much, you know, all, and, and all sorts of uh, decay and stuff. 100 million buffalo died in the Great Plains in the 1800s. 100 million of them shot, left to rot on the Great Plains. There's not a single buffalo fossil. To form a fossil, you have to bury something really fast and really deep in order for it not to decay. And I'll show you a few pictures before we're done of fossils that couldn't possibly have formed in the way we're told over millions of years. They've got to be buried by enormous amounts of sediment so fast, excluding oxygen and, and bacteria and fungus and, and things that would destroy them, that they are encapsulated and lots of minerals and water are permeating through them to replace the carbon with silica and minerals. We can form coal in a matter of weeks by just compacting down bark and cellulose and grass clippings and banana peels with a little bit of clay as a catalyst. And the pressure causes temperature to rise, lots of heat, no oxygen, lots of pressure, and you can start to form coal in a matter of weeks. It doesn't take millions of years. You see, what we're seeing is the result of the worldwide flood when we look at all these rock layers and all these fossils. But you leave the flood out of your thinking, you're just going to misinterpret it. You understand what we as Christians are saying? One day, here on Earth, in the past, there were no people. The next day, there was an Adam and Eve, fully formed, fully functional, brilliant, capable of worshiping and interacting and fellowshipping with God. Go tell that to a biology professor in a school. Go train your children to tell that to their classmates in school. Those kids have been trained, this is reality. You're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be ignored. You're going to be burned, you're going to be denied academic degrees in our culture if you believe what God told us is true. But there are no other alternatives. If people weren't fully formed by God, then something must have turned into a person, must have looked more like an ape. Where did it come from? What well, must have been something that ran around on four legs that looked less like an ape? Must have been something like this. 
So by leaving what God told us out of our thinking, this is the only other alternative, so it must be true. You get it? These people aren't being, they're, they're not out to deceive. They're not stupid. They've just left what God has told us out of their thinking, and they're coming to the only other possible conclusion. But it doesn't make it true. It just means they're leaving the truth out. You can't even find the proteins. You can't even find the enzymes. You can't find DNA. You can't find the complex chemicals anywhere in the world or the universe except inside of an already living cell. That's the only place they occur. So how did they get there? They don't know. They just pretend that it all made itself because the only alternative is that God did it. And by law, starting in 1948, our nation decided to have a separation of church and state. The state, the government, runs the school system. Anything pointing to, acknowledging, affirming God as real has to be left out. So by law, it's left out of the thinking. The box made itself, or the box as a maker, we've simply chosen as a culture to leave one of those options out. Well, guess what happens? Those children then become the professors and the teachers. They teach it even more strongly. They become, their students become the professors and the teachers and the textbook writers and the museum builders. They teach it even more strongly to the point they're totally blinded to any other option. That's what's going on. Doesn't mean it's true, but you gotta realize what your kids, what your neighbors, what your friends, what folks who have no interest in the church or God are up against because of the way they're being taught to think. Now, it's the flood that explains the rock layers. It explains the fossils. It explains rock layers that start in Texas, reappear in England, reappear New England, reappear the, the cliffs of Dover in England, run through Europe, and all the way down to Australia. The same rock layer. How does a single rock layer get laid across the entire Earth? Meanwhile, during this flood, the continents are moving around, not at the speed they are today, but rapidly. India is slamming up into Asia, shoving up the Himalaya mountains. Mount Everest did not exist before the flood. You understand? The things were changing enormously during this flood the Bible talks about. The world that then was, was deluged and destroyed. Deluged and destroyed. It's a language of total devastation. At the top of Mount Everest, we find fossils, clams, did a clam one day decide, I think I'm going to climb Mount Everest? <laughs> no, it was underwater. And those rock layers formed during the flood, they were shoved up rapidly in the later stages of the flood, which lasted almost a year and had reverberations for decades, if not centuries afterwards. An ice age followed the flood. Massive erosion happened as the continents are moved, lifting up at the end of the flood, water's rushing off of the continents, digging out things like the Grand Canyon, huge river valleys. The continental shelves are all the sediments that were washed off the continents during this period. You see, no one was there to film any of this stuff, but if you just take the Bible to mean what it says, it has all of these implications and it gives a big framework to then start to study geology, paleontology, and the fossils and understand how they got there. And it fits really, really well. It's just our education system can't go there because without enormous periods of time to form those rock layers, evolution can't be true. And therefore, God created separate forms of life. We show them things like coprolite. Here's a picture of showing the students a piece of coprolite. And, and we explain, this is a really unique kind of fossil. We let them touch it. We explain how you can sometimes tell if a fossil is a rock or a fossil by licking it, uh, because it'll have a, like, if it's a fossil, it'll often have a spongy appearance and your, your tongue won't stick to it. So, so I have some of the kids lick it, and then we let them know that coprolite is dinosaur poop. <laughs> <laughs> And oh my goodness, the roar of laughter that goes up. And, and uh, so uh, we show them, I mean, how do you fossilize a piece of skin over millions of years? It would be long, long ago decayed. Here is a fish eating another fish. It was captured almost instantaneously in the fossil record. It's not a slow, gradual process that takes huge periods of time. 
Here's an ichosaur. It's a kind of a, a dinosaur type um, creature that lived in the sea giving birth. And it was said, well, maybe those two creatures were just captured. And as they studied closer, they found another one was still in the birth canal that hadn't come out yet. Captured as a fossil in the process of giving birth. We're talking major, massive, rapid catastrophe that buried all of these creatures. Uh, and what was saved by God's grace was a representative type of creature. Now, Noah didn't have to have two Chihuahuas and two Great Danes and two you know, Irish setters because God knew the complexity in any given type of creature built into the DNA code would diversify after the flood. Had Noah been told, go get two of every kind of creature, he'd probably picked his favorite kind of dog. But you see, that an Irish setter is basically a wolf where that information has been subdivided and subdivided and subdivided, and you keep putting together creatures of the same size with the same amount of hair that look similar until you get rid of everything that doesn't look like an Irish setter, and you end up with a wee little subset of the information that was originally in that wolf-type creature, dog-type canine creature. And then you get nothing but Irish setters from then on, because you've eliminated all the other variety. Only God could have known which creatures to send to save, to repopulate what the earth was going to look like after the flood, so they would survive in different environments. And you'll notice in the book of Genesis what happened. God sent the animals to Noah. See how every little detail is significant once we understand biology and the biological implications? And everything else was buried. This world was totally restructured. A mile thick sediment layers. Everything was pulverized by tsunami after tsunami moving across the planet as the very earth cracked open. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is something called the Ring of Fire that runs from the North Pole down to Ardenica, up through the coast, past South America, all the way up through Alaska. And it's a crack of active volcanic areas where enormous amounts of magma poured out, shoving the oceans upward, vaporizing enormous amounts of water that probably came down as rain for 40 days and 40 nights. There may or may not have been some sort of a protective canopy that collapsed. That's real vague and debatable even amongst creation scientists. But there was massive catastrophe. That's what explains the dinosaurs. The fossils give us enormous scientific evidence for this flood. And we would tell the kids that this book is their primary textbook. Yes, they have textbooks, but remember, what's in them is an interpretation that leaves the Bible out. And these kids were open to this. You know, our kids in America, by and large, have been trained to ignore it by the time they're even in junior high, let alone high school. You gotta understand what's going on. It's a system that we've funded to leave God out of the thinking of the generation going through that education system. Now, some parents are forced to, and there are phenomenal Christians teaching, but everyone I teach to say, for the most part, our hands are tied. We do what we can, but the curriculum is fixed, and we've got to at least, even if we tell the students we don't believe everything, it's still there. Thy word is the lamp unto the feet and the light unto my path. Now, this is where we would end. Ten times, God says, creatures reproduce after their own kind. That is biology. That's the framework to understand biology. One creature doesn't turn into another. Completely different body structure. There are body structures that can vary rapidly. A lizard stays a lizard with lots of variety. You know, a bacteria stays a bacteria with lots of variety. But they stay their own kind. Death is here because of our actions, not because there's been millions of years of death through the fossil record. We'll talk more about that during uh, the sermon time. There has been a real worldwide catastrophe. In Genesis chapter 7, God is so specific. He says, every hill under heaven on earth was covered by water. How do you misinterpret that? Every hill under heaven on earth, and yet almost Every seminary and Bible college out there says, well, Genesis is describing a little local flood. 
Genesis goes on to say, every creature died. Every bird died. Every substance was destroyed. Only Noah and those on the ark survived. See how specific God is? Because he knew we were going to get this wrong. If we get it wrong, we misinterpret the rocks. If we misinterpret the rocks, all of a sudden we come up with a fanciful story called geological, biological, chemical evolution to try to pretend he doesn't even exist. So he made it really crystal clear in the Bible what the truth is. But to maintain credibility, most of these seminaries want to draw in the money and the students. They want to be academically credible, so they just ignore that part of the Bible in order to fit in with what the world is teaching with devastating consequences to the church. Again, we'll, we'll continue that. Then people spread out as different people groups after the flood, creating the Incas, the Chinese, the, the, the Egyptians, the Aztecs, all of these different people, the American Indians coming across the Bering Straits, Ice Age raging, cultures spreading out. That's the biblical view of where these cultures came from. And then you get to Christ on the cross. And when we tied it all together, and we always save the last 10 minutes for a clear presentation of who is this creator and what has he done for you personally, that's where you'd see the response from the students. Now, I've got about 10 minutes left. I want to show, we would often wrap up by showing them how can the textbooks writers be so wrong? How can experts who have spent their life studying biology and genetics, how can they be so wrong? And this is the one example that I would give them, other than the idea that they're just misinterpreting it and they come blind to any other possibility. Next year, I'm gonna be going to the Philippines, to Vanuatu, to Mexico, and continue to go back to Fiji and do these presentations in these school, public schools, to these kids. And uh, we went to the full color hardcover book, and you're gonna see these uh, coming up. Now I wanna show you what happened in February of this year as we went back a second time. This is 11 months after the first trip to Fiji. It just blew me away. The first thing is, we found out there are about two dozen Fiji churches where the pastors and their wives are committed to every single day pray until every student in their nation has heard the gospel message and has seen what they're learning in school connected back to the Bible. And every day they're praying that this will continue and that it'll happen and the lives will be changed. Um, we had 100,000 of these books arrive while we were there um, back in February and they came in these big shipping containers. They were unloaded into the churches and they filled like every nook and cranny of these churches. Here's, I mean, all the way to the ceiling you see these books stacked up. Imagine four enormous shipping containers unloaded into church after church after church and they're waiting for teams of American scientists to come and do these presentations in the schools and personally do these presentations and give these to the students. Then we met with the president of Fiji. Can you imagine meeting with the president of the United States? Because you're bringing biblical truth into their school system and they want this. They don't want the next generation to slowly think Christianity is just fantasy where everything else they're learning is reality. Um, this is a typical assembly. We spoke to 25 high schools in February. This is about a thousand kids. We'd often be standing, you know, out in the open. You could barely see the PowerPoint, so we had to do a lot of this verbally in a lot of these presentations. Four speakers, um, one of them was Dr. Jerry Bergman. He's written uh, about 40 books on the evidence for creation. He has three earned PhDs, biology, uh, biochemistry, and geology, and uh, four other master's degrees, impeccable credentials, okay? came over to come into the schools. It's one of the keys to getting into their schools. And the students were just fascinated. They've just, they were absolutely riveted to what they were hearing because they'd never heard anything like this. School after school after school we'd go into. So I just want to wrap up by saying God is moving. This whole subject is foundational to what's leading the kids away in our country. And because we can't go through our education system, we as Christians have got to go around it. We've got to be showing the credibility of the Bible from the very start to the people around us because it does impact their lives and their hearts. And it's that tool God will use to get through to them in many cases. So I hope that's encouraging um, that 
to see what can be happening in another country. And I don't know where this is all leading. I can't do this all on my own. I'm just trying to raise the funds to print the books and get other scientist friends to come along and do these presentations. And as I said, we'll be doing six of them next year in four different countries. And we'll see what happens from there. But um, sign up on my newsletter list, be part of it. These books cost about $4 each to print. And I just print them as the money comes in and we get them into these students' hands and it's changing lives. So thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.